So now we're going to pick up with the second section of this unit, which is industrialization, the Industrial Revolution. So uh, we'll jump right in. So the Industrial Revolution really begins in Great Britain uh, with this guy, Samuel Slater. So in 1793, Samuel Slater builds this machine here to his right, which is the textile mill. He builds the first successful textile mill. Um, and the way that this textile mill works is off of steam power, you know, from river water so it's a really incredible machine because you can really use it anywhere that's near water it doesn't require electricity so the way that the textile mill works is um, it's got all of these hooks and stuff you see each of these little things these are all hooks and you can thread um, you know uh, whether it be thread or yarn or whatever through all of this um, and you turn this crank here and it, the machine uh, pushes back and forth and it weaves all of this thread and it creates textiles. Textiles are cloth material, right? Um, and this is such a faster way of creating textiles than ever before. Um, it can create lot, uh, larger quantities also and this is a really incredible machine. So uh, textile mills start popping up all over Great Britain and Great Britain is making a lot of money off of it and they're like, you know, we need to keep this new technology top secret. You know, no can know about this. So they actually tell Samuel Slater it is not going to even be legal for you to sell the the prints for this, to sell the idea of the um, textile mill and how it works to any other country because we won't be the only one that, that has it. And Samuel Slater's like, no way. I'm not allowing that. I want my ideas to be out there. I want everyone to be able to use this machine that I created. I created it to revolutionize the world, not just Great Britain. So he actually breaks the law and brings these new machines to the United States and shows um, companies how, how they work and start selling them. So we're really going to see the textile industry um, begin to blow up um, in North America because of this. So um, by 1810, we actually have more than 60 mills spinning, spinning thread in, new, in the New England area. So really you can just assume all of this manufacturing and stuff is going to be um, in the New England area, meaning the north, right? All of the industry is going to be in the north and the south is going to be all farming. So um, in, ju you know, in just really less than 15 years, we've got 60 mills. By 1813, we even have our first factory that incorporates every process of cloth production, you know, making the cotton into thread, then spinning the textiles, then uh, treating and processing the materials to be able to send them out and be sold, things like that. We've got a, a factory that will actually do every level of that. So that's going to, um, you know, the boom of the textile industry is going to seep into every other part of American industry. You know, um, there's someone that has to make these machines. So, um, you know, metal works and machine making industries are going to boom. And, um, you know, the, all the people that work in these industries are going to spend money and that's going to help spur the economy in a positive direction anyway. So you see here, this is a map of uh, or graph of pretty much all of these economies, all these major global economies um, from 1500 to 1913. So this is GDP. If you know what GDP means, that means gross domestic product. That's essentially how much money our country's making. So you see everybody takes an uptick here in the 1800s, and that's because of the Industrial Revolution. But who takes the most? It's us. We really see um, the United States GDP is going to skyrocket um, as a result of the Industrial Revolution because we are really going to not only take Take, um, the benefits we get from the Industrial Revolution, but we're going to, or not, I mean, not just the inventions that we get, but we're going to really figure out how to make those as profitable as possible. And that is because we are not only creating the manufactured goods, but we're creating the raw materials as well in the South. So we can do every aspect of uh, product creation here in um, the United States. So this guy is Francis Lowell. Francis Lowell was um, a textile merchant in Boston, and in 1822 he buys up a bunch of mills and starts building, you know, these textile mills and other buildings all right around each other, like a little textile mill compound, um, sort of set up like a college campus, um, you know, with multiple buildings all together. And he begins making a huge profit because of how productive it is. It's very efficient to have everything right around each other. Um, eventually, it grows to be, you know, four. 40 mill buildings spinning 10,000 textile looms, which is massive. And he thinks, you know, what is the way to make this even more profitable? 
I should be targeting, um, you know, employees that can live at the textile mills and work all the time, um, essentially. So uh, the only real type of person that is capable and, and available to do that job it, at, in 18 40s is um, young women. So he, we see the emergence of what we call the Lowell girls. So the Lowell girls are um, uh, the girls that are working in the Lowell mills. Most of them were uh, from you know farming uh, families, uh, local communities um, who weren't necessarily very wealthy, but um, but they weren't you know horribly off. Uh, same uh, Francis Lowell would have people go out to these you know like small towns and stuff and say hey. You know, your daughter isn't, she's working on the farm, but she's not making a lot of money for you guys. She's not married. She doesn't have any prospects. Who's going to take care of her? She's draining on your family. Let her come with us. We can put her to work. She's going to make money, be independent. She's going to uh, be in a big city. She's going to get to meet all these men, you know, have all these suitors. Someone will snatch her up, wife her up, and then she won't have to work anymore. But she will have gained all this incredible experience and helped your family at the same time. And someone's like, I mean, how do you say no to that? That's an incredible offer. So they're like, absolutely yes take my daughter so um these girls were typically you know young i would say you know between the ages of like 17 and maybe 30 so really in their 20s and late late teens and uh they would live at the mills and they would work for 14 hours a day six days a week which is pretty aggressive so you see here they're not too glamorous of girls um this girl's hair looks like a paintbrush you know it looks like you could pick her up and paint with her um but we this is really how the the mills are set up this bit these little buildings right here in the middle are dormitories so this is like where they would live and then there's this big building right here and this is where the mills would be so you see there's like many buildings this is just a small portion of the Lowell compound um so it, it really produced an insane amount of stuff the girls days were organized on a system of bells so you know you remember the bell that you had at your old school before you came to GCMC um, the, it would be a bell like that only that bell would be your alarm clock and it would tell you when to go to breakfast and when breakfast was over and when to get in the shower and when your shower uh, was over and when to be at work and when you could take your break and when your break was over and then when lunch started and then when lunch was over and it would just go on and on and on until it told you when to go to bed so uh, not a very glamorous way of living and they they were paid fair wages you know nothing that was impressive but they weren't trying to stiff these girls out of a um a good working wage uh but a lot of them didn't get a lot of um you know respect from communities they thought that they would be respected for making this independent move and that's really not ends up happening happening at all a lot of people are still really resistant to the idea of of women working so um it's definitely a new thing that francis lowell has uh here for himself and it's going to be very very uh good for him in terms of money so because of all these industries, we're going to see the growth of cities, and that is called urbanization. Urbanization is the growth of cities. So urban just means, you know, in the city of the city. So you see here, this is a map of population density. All these little red dots, these are where the country is the most densely populated, meaning that's where we've got a lot of people living in a very small space. So these are Baltimore, New York, and Boston. So that makes sense, right? Right where these little red dots are, where we have some big cities so you see um all around here this is really where the original 13 colonies were right you know right around the coast you see like the jamestown northern north carolina area um but eventually we're starting to see that spread west so um in 1820 only 7% of Americans lived in cities, uh, so not a lot. You know, New York is starting to become a city, but it's not very populated. Really, our two big cities are going to be Baltimore and uh, Boston, um, but in 30 years, really by 1850, the, that amount of people living in cities has doubled, and that's because that's where the jobs are. That's where the industry is. People are moving to the cities to uh, be able to get all of these incredible jobs, so how do you get to the city? Transportation. How, do your, how does your business work it relies on transportation you know you have to be able to get um, materials and uh, you have to be able to send out your product so uh, we're going to see some changes in transportation uh, throughout the early 1800s um, so in 1811 the United States builds the National Road the National Road stretched all the way from Cumberland Maryland all the way out here to Illinois uh, which is about 800 miles long pretty lengthy um, and this road essentially not only connects the you know the east coast with what 
at that point was the western bit of the United States. It also connects the East Coast with the Mississippi River. So, um, you know, any city along the Mississippi River has access now, you know, to ship something up the Mississippi and get it uh, to port here, and then they can take it along the National Road and get it to the East Coast. So it's a really uh, a great road. It's going to be used a lot for business. Um, we also, in 1825, build the Erie Canal. Um, so here is the Erie Canal. The Erie Canal is about 363 miles long. It stretches from uh, the Hudson River, which you see over there, all the way across the state of New York to Lake Erie, one of the Great Lakes. So what major city is down here at the base of the Hudson River, but New York City. So the Erie Canal is actually what makes New York City New York City. Um, you know, before it was a small, I mean, it was, it was a city, but it was mostly just a, uh, you know, a small shipping city. This really makes New York City a trading city, you know, where business is done. And we're going to see New York City really blow up um, in terms of population and money because of the Erie Canal. So what are we going to put on these uh, canals and these rivers? We're going to put steamboats on them. Uh, Robert Fulton is actually going to be the owner and operator of the first real steamboat service. We had steamboats before, but, um, you know, they weren't really used to their full potential. And this is really when we were going to start to see them become very popular. In 1807, he starts his business, the North River Steamboat of Claremont, and the idea of the steamboat really is going to spread really quickly, and a lot of companies are going to start basing themselves along the Ohio and Mississippi rivers because they can use the steamboat for shipping goods and materials, all of that thanks to Robert Fulton. We're also going to see the railroad. In 1830, we're going to get the first ever steam-powered train. Uh, lots of things, if you haven't noticed, are going to be powered by steam. We already mentioned uh, the steam-powered textile mill, the steam-powered boat, and now we're talking about the steam-powered train. So in 1835, you know, just five years after the first train ever, okay, um, there are already 200 contracts out to different people to start constructing and building railroad lines. So you know immediately uh, people in the United States, the United States government knows that this is going to be a big ticket item. This is going to be something that really impacts the way that we live and the way that we do business. So by 1840, you see on this map, we have over 3,000 miles of track. Um, you know, these rail lines that go all over, you know, the East Coast here down, and we've even got some in the South, you know, around Atlanta and Savannah and these places, which is going to be, uh, even up here in the Great Lakes area, we're going to have some rail lines. By 1890, we're going to have it covering the whole continent here. We're going to have from one side to the other, all the way across the country, uh, which is going to be uh, really awesome and is going to help business even more. But um, when we get to this point, this is really when uh, the steamboat starts to sort of phase out. Um, it, uh, you know, at this point, steamboats are going to be really necessary because if you're doing business out west or if you're in the south, trains aren't going to be as available to you. Um, but eventually, steamboats are really going to not be as necessary because trains are going to be cheaper and faster. And we're going to have almost 300,000 miles of track uh, covering the whole country. You know, they're fast and reliable. Um, and it's going to, you know, really easily replace uh, the steamboat. Uh, so communication, we're going to have some changes in communication. Um, in 1811, we get our steam-powered printing press. So the steam-powered printing press can print much faster and in much greater volumes, and that's really important because print is how news spreads in the 1800s. We don't have the radio, we don't have TV, we don't have internet, we don't have anything. All we have is, uh, you know, print. We have newspapers and we have books and things like that. So uh, being able to print so much more, so much faster is really, really important. Um, so we're also going to see the postal service uh, become, uh, you know, more popular because of steamboats and railroads. Uh, mail delivery is faster and more widely available. So in 1840, when we only, I mean 1800, we only have a thousand post offices. By 1840, we have 12,000 post offices. This guy, Samuel Morris, he's actually going to invent this machine right here, which is the telegraph. Uh, so the telegraph sends messages through electrical wires. You put your finger right here and you tap this to this uh, in a series of dashes and dots. Um, you know, like tap, 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 tap. That is sort of uh, the code that you use, and that is called Morse code, right? You should have heard of that before, Morse code, invented by Samuel Morse. Um, so the telegraph makes communication 
instant, right? No more um, it taking months to get a message to someone. Thanks to the telegraph, we can uh, notify someone immediately very far away of news.